of you know the story of the Titanic, the seemingly uh, unsinkable ship. And it was brought to our attention again, you know, every so many years they put out another movie, and of course it was quite an epic movie, that came out with Leonardo DiCaprio and, and uh, Kate Winslet. And, uh, and you know, uh, James Cameron did an amazing job of making that seem like it was real. Well, uh, there is a true story that comes out of the Titanic that you may not be aware of. There was a lady that found her way into one of the lifeboats. And when she got in the lifeboat before it was lowered down into the North Atlantic, she realized that there was something that she needed to go back to her stateroom to get. So she appealed for the idea that, or asked that she would be able to go back to the stateroom. And the person that was in charge of that boat said, you've got three minutes, otherwise we leave without you. She went on what was now a a trajectory that was slanted as the ship was going down. She went through uh, what was the gambling room. All the money had been slid to the side, and it was ankle deep. She got to her stateroom, and when she got to her stateroom, she pushed past what was all of her jewelry, diamonds, the diamond rings, the necklaces that she had, and she went past that and over it to a shelf. There she grabbed three oranges. And she got back to the lifeboat in time, and she was able to be rescued. There are moments in which our priorities shift. A half hour earlier, she would not have given what was the smallest diamond in her collection for a crate of oranges. But at that moment, those oranges were to her uh, something that was life-giving, and she was willing even to take a chance on not getting back into the boat. I want to talk about priorities today. I want to talk about God adjusting our priorities, and I believe that we're going to end the service with just an open altar and going back into the song that we just sang a moment ago as we concluded the time of praise and worship before the message. And as we do, we'll come together as a family, and we're going to be right at the feet of Jesus. We're going to ask that God just begin to realign what so easily is set out of alignment in the D.C. area, and that is the priorities in our lives. When we look at the scriptures, there's some wonderful stories that I'm going to be bringing us to, uh, to where we'll better understand this whole concept of prioritization. Life is truly, in its truest sense, uh, life is a constant succession of prioritizing. We prioritize our decisions. We're constantly considering what's important to us and what's less important, trying to make the decision between good and better trying to make decisions that are sometimes hard to make, but we make them every day, and it's called prioritizing. What we prioritize ends up being where we give the lion's share of our time and our resources, our passion, our commitment. Uh, We give the lion's share of our finances. We give the lion's share, again, of our time, which speaks so much to what is important to us is where we give our time. And what we prioritize will have all of that. Now, there's a a survey that is rather fascinating. And this survey is actually shocking. The question was asked, and I want you to consider it for a moment before we put it up on the screen. The question was asked, if you uh, were to be able to get $2 million to do some of the following things, would you do it? In other words, for $2 million, what would you do? This was the response that was given. For $2 million, 25% of individuals would be willing to abandon their entire family. One out of four. 23% would be willing to become prostitutes for a week or more. 16% would be willing to give up their American citizenship. 16% would be uh, willing to leave their spouse. 10% would be willing to withhold testimony and let her murderer go free. 7% would be willing to kill a stranger for $2 million. And 3% would be willing to put their children up for adoption. I'd make a joke about that with my kids, but they're all in children's ministry today, but (laughs) we wouldn't do that for $2 million. 2.5. Wouldn't do it. Don't say that to our kids. We love them. 
Kids are always hearing, your dad preached about you today. You know what he said? Um, and you know, what's interesting in that survey is that the key factor that you see there is money. The idea of getting ahead in life. And money has become a god, little g, an idol in America. Certainly, globally, we can see it in different areas. And of course, uh, maybe there would be a, a different version of things in tribal areas, in the very poverty-stricken areas. But, but in the United States of America, we talk about what is the American dream, that idea of achieving something. And so we're, we prioritize that as being so, so very important to us. Jesus spoke of treasure. Jesus spoke of you know, money in the scriptures. But when Jesus spoke of treasure, it's very interesting to see in, in uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, when Jesus spoke of treasure. And Jesus said in the Matthew 6, starting the 19th verse, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What a powerful statement. Where your treasure is, your prioritization, that reveals and identifies your heart. That's why I think this is so vital a message, not only today, but to return to over and over again. Now, side note, and this is not really about what I'm preaching today, but I thought about it when Lisa was talking about our missionaries over in Niger. The Jessica Neff sent me uh, a message on Facebook, and Jessica said that she has been watching the messages from Capital Life, Capital Life Church uh, there in Niger. So, hey, isn't that wonderful? Uh, we actually are being listened to in Niger. And, um, and she said that it's so amazing to her that I've been speaking about the Holy Spirit and talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and talking about miracles and believing for God to intervene in our lives in ways that cannot be described outside of the presence of God and the intervention of God. It's not one of those things where I lucked out on my test, I got a B instead of the D I deserved. That's not a miracle. What we're talking about is the intervention of God where you cannot explain that simply in natural terms. And she said, what is, the reason why it's so amazing to her is that that's the very thing God's been grappling with her about in Niger. She's believing for miracles. She's believing to see the intervention of God there in the country and in her life, and God's stirring her in that way to pray bigger prayers than she's ever prayed before, to launch out in ways that she's never launched out before. And she wanted us to know that she appreciates our prayers. So when Lisa's praying up here, leading us in prayer for our missionaries in Niger, remember, they're not just wanting, you know, light prayers prayed over them. They want prayers for miracles. Amen? Let's believe for Niger to absolutely know what it is to fall on their knees and receive Jesus as Savior. Let's believe for those churches that you've invested in that are now spreading across Niger, and, and you in your giving have financially invested in Niger in these churches. Some of them are smaller, some of them a little bit larger than that. We've got children's ministry there. Listen, when we invest in Niger, we're investing in God's heart. God's heart is after Niger. Therefore, when we pray, when we send missionaries, we can know we're right where God's heart is. Amen? Amen. Back to the idea of prioritization. And so uh, Jesus introduces what is a revolutionary concept. And that revolutionary concept is found in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, in the 18th verse. And the Bible says in the 18th verse of the fourth chapter, uh, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So Jesus is saying that if you want to make a good investment, I'm going to give you advice that would be different from those financial planners that are out there at Charles Schwab and different places, um, you know, that would give you financial advice. If you want really good advice, I want you to invest in what you cannot see. Now, that's hard for us to do because our investment is in the American dream. 
Our investment is what is very tangible and before our eyes and what we experience and, and we can sense with the five physical senses. But Jesus says something, again, very revolutionary, that we're to invest in what is not seen. There is a kingdom, and the God's kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom is, is a kingdom in which God is moving in a, in a story from Genesis to the book of Revelation. We can see that God is bringing man back into alignment with him. God is reaching out for man. He loves us. He loves men and women. He sent his only son to die for us. The greatest sacrifice that could be imagined of any father to give is their own child to die on behalf of another. God did that for us. That is God investing in us. Now, what we need to see is this unseen kingdom is where we need to be investing. 